Now, if I don't tell people that I'm HIV positive, nobody will know. And I have been HIV positive for good 18 years. And I am beautiful, I am black, and I'm African, and I'm queer. Hello, everyone. I'm Larry Angela of the Art and Proud African LGBT YouTube channel. This evening, I have a, a big African palace, say a big elephant in the house. He is a gay rights activist. He's a teacher, he's an author, he's a lawyer, and he is a reverend, Reverend Roland Babajide Makoli. It is a honor to have you on our show. Thank you so much. Who is Reverend Jide Makoli? Thanks for all the big introductions <laughs> to start with. Um, I like to make things simple, I like to make things easier, okay? simply call me Jide Makoli, or oh, actually everybody calls me Reverend Mother, so that's even better. Mm. Um, who is Jide Makoli? Um, you know, Jide Makoli is not just uh, a gay activist. Jide Makoli is a, a proud and celebrated African uh, of Nigerian heritage. Um, of course, I'm black and I'm British, and I'm very proud of that. Um, I'm also a priest. Uh, an Anglican priest in the Church of England, um, uh, you know, uh, priesthood that I achieved, you know, during the lockdown. So September last year, I got ordained to priesthood. Um, I'm, I'm also the founder and chief executive of House of Rainbow, uh, an organization that supports the well-being and the spiritual development and the reconciling of faith and sexuality of black, African, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and queer people. Um, so I am all of that and many. I'm, I'm also an HIV activist. I'm HIV positive and, I, and, you know, I mean, I do like to include that in many of my introductions. And, you know, that takes you on a journey of intersectionality. Being a gay rights activist, mm -hmm. I, when you have um, verses in the Old Testament, for instance, in the Genesis, uh, New Testament, you have Lepticos, you have um, in the room in Romans that uh, speaks against homosexuality. How do you interpret these verses? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that you know these things take time. Um, you know, I mean, I was born in London, but I grew up in Nigeria, so um, my formative years were in Nigeria. So. Um, my upbringing and my Christian upbringing were also in Nigeria. So like many young people, I also discovered scriptures, you know, that clearly says that if a man has sex with another man, it's an abomination and they should be put to death. Even though I read all of those in scriptures as a young person, I'm actually saying now, and anyone listening needs to understand that, that from Genesis through to Revelation, there is no scripture in the Bible that condemns homosexuality. So you cannot take a literal reading of a biblical text and make it gospel. You understand me? If we're going to take the verse that says that, you know, especially Leviticus that you mentioned, Leviticus 18, um, 22 and 20, 13, you know, clearly says if a man has sex with another man, it is an abomination and they should be put to death. But these texts are being taken out of context. This is not applicable to the condemnation nor the killing of gay people. Then and now, this is not what it's saying. Because, you know, I mean, that's why I do uh, a lot of teaching and training on how to understand those scriptures. And there are three elements to understanding Bible scriptures. Yeah. One is who wrote this chapter who wrote this story, right? Who were the audience? Who was the writer talking to? And what was the purpose of this communication? Right. Now, Leviticus was a communication between God and the Israelites. And you need to understand that the Israelites were held in bondage in Egypt for over 400 years. Right. It meant that, you know, that particular tribe has depleted over those years. So when they finally left Egypt, you know, 
in Leviticus, if people read Leviticus chapter 18, verse 1 to 4, yeah. right, it clearly says that God is talking to Moses to tell the Israelites, you know, Sammy, I am taking you to the promised Promise land. land. Do not do as they do in Egypt where I'm bringing you from. And don't do as they do in Canaan for where I'm taking you to. And these are the laws that you need to abide by in order for your, for your community, for your tribe to increase. So there were laws. There were laws because procreation was important for the Israelites right, to survive. Yeah. That is not a blanket condemnation of homosexuality. Wow. That's not a blanket condemnation. And of course, you know, we talk about Genesis because you said people are asking questions. You know, Genesis chapter 19, right? Okay, um, maybe probably the first 20 verses were often used to narrate the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. There were homosexuals here and there. I want to guarantee you and everyone listening to us today that there is nowhere in that story that concludes nor give us the evidence that homosexuality took place at all. Okay? Now, the fact that there were a group of people that approached, you know, Lot's, Lot's. house yeah. and asked to know the man. I mean, Larry, you're not Yoruba, okay? You're right. You understand me? If I say I want to know you, Larry Mofe Moe, you know, <laughs> Jackie Moe. Let me know you. Does it mean I'm saying I want to have sex with you? No, it doesn't now, mean that. The challenge with Bible is that Bible is, is a documentation of oral history. So just imagine we're having this conversation now, and then this conversation is passed on to other people mm. in the next 500 years, and finally someone wrote it down. Do you think that the original conversation has been noted? No, some will be lost. Something will be lost. That is why, you know, when we talk about Chinese whispers, you know, something is lost along the line. So it seems to me that there is something that people are holding on to about interpretation and translation or even the meaning. And let us also remember that we read the Bible in English in most parts of the English world or in the in English colony. The original language of the Bible was not English. So it also meant that there's a lot of translation. And that is why... We need to try to look at scholarly materials around the time that the Bible was written in order to understand the context. Mm. Now, we're in 2021 today. Yeah. If you're telling somebody, you know, how to dial a telephone, they talk about swiping. They talk about digital communication. Even 20 years ago, we didn't have digital communication. Yeah. You understand me? Yeah, right. There was a time we had analog telephone. Show an analog telephone to a five-year-old, they wouldn't know what this is. At all. You understand me? So this is what we're talking about. Now, in order to understand the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, you need to read Genesis 18, the chapter before Genesis mm, 19. 19. And in order to understand that, you will see that Abraham and Lot were from the same family their uncles and nephew, right? And they showed hospitality to strangers in foreign lands. And the people of Sodom do not like foreigners. Yeah. Honestly, even Genesis 19 verse 34, it says that, you know, we should treat foreigners as if they are citizens. So Lot and Abraham, wherever they go, they look after foreigners. And this is part of their own culture. They are accustomed to be nice to people. To, to strangers. To strangers. But the people of Sodom do not like strangers. So if people read Genesis very well, particularly Genesis 19, you know, we can unpack what the problem is. Mm. And there is not a single problem of homosexuality in that story. Let me give you a clear analogy that happened in Genesis. Genesis says that all the men from Sodom yeah. and the neighboring city, Gomorrah, came to the house of Lot, right? Now, just imagine there are 2,000 people living in each of those towns. Yeah. Can you imagine 4,000 people outside your door, screaming and shouting, bring them out so that we can have sex with them, even if that was the case? Does that sound like homosexuality to you? No. Hell no. No. This is violence. This is xenophobia, you know? They even said to Lot that, you know, you came here as a stranger. 
as a foreigner and you want to be a judge over us that is xenophobia it is the bible said that they pressed against his door they no. wanted to break it down that is attempted criminal damage i'm a lawyer so i think that it's helpful that we look at the evidence and please somebody tell me where the homosexual act took place no you cannot justify condemning an entire community of marginalized people based on the fact that they said bring them out so that we may know that and people say oh well yeah but then he gave his daughter to them what is that okay he gave his daughter to them let me explain that you know in the tradition of the old testament times right women girls and women are properties they are properties of their fathers and then properties of their husbands right yeah. So that is why if a woman is, is married and then divorced, no one else will marry her back in those days, right? If a woman becomes a widow, she also becomes an outcast. Yeah. That is why widows for so many long, in our world today, become an outcast in society, right? So let's look at it this way, right? Lot gave his daughters and said, please do not do this wicked thing to my visitors, have my daughters. Who, which parent today will substitute their daughters, you know what I mean, in an attempt against a violent rape, attempted violent rape. So to me, that is really, really a key part, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so I got distracted by that. Yeah, it's all so right. So this is a key <clears throat> part of that conversation too. You see, Lephitic and Genesis requires us to pay attention to details, right? When the Bible says that all the men both old and young, yeah. in the Old Testament narration of men also includes women. So when it says both old and young, it will have to mean all the young people and all the old oh. people, you understand me? Some of them are probably, you know, using their two walking mm -hmm. sticks coming along. It's because <clears throat> they don't last. I mean, you know, Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49 to 52 gave us a simple response. It says, this was the sin of Sodom. They were haunty, they had prosperous ease, they were wealthy, but they did not take care of the needy and the poor. This is why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Now let me take you back to Abraham and Lot. When they left their own homeland, there was a point where they got into a fight. And Abraham said to Lot, look, I don't like this fight between us, right? Look over where you want to go. So Lot looked towards Sodom and saw that it was green, it was beautiful. He goes, no, I'm going over there. Yeah. And Abraham went the other way, towards Mamre. That is why even in a country like England, there is still a lot of, there is a lot of prosperity in this country, but also comes responsibility. And this is why I am still fighting for the right of asylum seekers fleeing you know, persecution from other countries, you know, Sammy, that has violent laws or hostile regulations against the LGBT community. And when they get here, I think it's important that they're able to settle down and able to find that ease as well. This country has prosperous ease. Right. But this country <clears throat> also needs to learn how to share that prosperity with others. At the end of the day, a lot of the countries like Nigeria, Uganda, Malawi were under colonial rules. So what is the exchange in this time that we need this country? So when people are fleeing persecution and coming here, as far as I'm concerned, even Lefiticus, you know, 1934, says that we should welcome foreigners and treat them as if they are citizens. Mm. And if this country believes that we're a Christian country, then I think those are golden rules that we need to go back to. Thank you very much, Jide. You spoke about persecution of the LGBT community in Africa. Um, recently, there have been negative reports from Africa as it concerns the LGBT community. In Uganda, um, sexual offenses uh, bill was passed recently and um, about 44 people were recently arrested. In Cameroon, two trans women were jailed for five years. YouTube recently banned a televangelist in Nigeria because he was performing, um, he was cleansing two lesbians you know and um, I know House of Rainbow uh, is at the vanguard of the fight against um, 
conversion therapy. Uh, I just want to, then I know you are speaking tonight. Tell us about this fight against um, uh, conversion therapy and your take on these negative reports all over Africa. The, the challenge with um, the persecution of lesbian, gay, bisexual in Africa is actually not an African problem. It's actually the problem of the colonizers. So we need to go back in history and look at how did we inherit this hostile colonial laws that has come to persecute us. You see, the law has been used against the LGBT community and in most cases we know that it's politically driven. Because when you look at the history of the persecution of LGBT people in Africa, we now have former African president asking for forgiveness of how they've used the laws against the LGBT community. Former president of Nigeria, President Goodall Jonathan, yeah. he has apologized or he has indicated that he would never have used those laws if he knew the ramifications. Um, the former president of Botswana and even a former president, a couple of former presidents from South Africa. And also, let's just look at countries in Africa that have decriminalized homosexuality. Yeah. We got Seychelles, Angola, uh, Mozambique, you understand me? And, and these countries have decriminalized and they've not fallen apart. I think that the deep-rooted problem with uh, the criminalization of LGBT people in Africa is still politically driven. So when a, a government is trying to detract from the problems, I mean, you have a country like Nigeria and Uganda where the, the, the infrastructures are not there, you know, the, the systems are not working, the health services are chaotic, but they wanted to use homosexuality as a distractor. Yeah. So it is rather unfortunate that it is the, the marginalized and unfortunate LGBT people, excuse me, that are being arrested. In Uganda, 44 LGBT people were being rounded up in, from a safe shelter. What does that tell you about the people that arrested them? That's despicable. Carlos. Exactly. In Ghana, recently we had 21 people being arrested from an, a meeting, a meeting about the welfare and health of the LGBT community. Even earlier on in Ghana, you know, an LGBT center was shut down. Yeah. Now, for me, that is violence against the LGBT people. It is. That is, um, you know, power because what the LGBT people are trying to do in Ghana is to create safe spaces and when you hear the narratives about LGBT people go to mainstream services they don't get the appropriate counseling they don't get the sensitive you know pastoral care they don't get the support you know they're being victimized then why can't they self-organize every government not just in Africa has a responsibility to protect the human rights of their citizens. Right. They have a responsibility to provide, provide a higher standard of health care for their citizens. Every citizen in this world have the right to life and have a right to family. They have the right to assemble. They have a right to freely worship, whether in church or they can organize their own religious spaces. They have that right. I mean, it's, it's not just, you know, Uganda and Ghana or Nigeria but also South Africa. South Africa has one of the most progressive constitutions on equality, but yet we hear every single day that a gay or a lesbian or a trans person is being killed or being raped in what is called correction rape. Rape, yeah. Right. But of course, you know, I mean, more recently, I mean, House of Rainbow with several other organizations in the UK, we've been looking at the issues of conversion therapy. Now, conversion therapy are mainly used by religious organizations or religious bodies, you know what I mean, to um, press on the LGBT people to change behaviors. I mean, you cannot change people's sexual orientation by changing their behavior. So for me, um, it is damaging and we have a lot of evidence in the work that we do. We have so many stories and testimonials of the pain and anxiety you know, I have a recent case in the last 24 hours where, you know, I mean, there's a, a young gay man who felt that he's trapped in a marriage, a heterosexual marriage, where he doesn't want to be there. 
So we have many cases. We have many cases. I went through conversion therapy myself. Hmm. I know the pain and the abuse that I went through. I know the snide remarks that has been said to me. I know when we gather in a room to pray that they have to now invite us to pray against the spirit of homosexuality. I mean, how does that make you feel? Damaging. I mean, can you imagine me being in a room and, and a, a group of white people are saying, let us pray against the spirit of being black. Pray against the spirit of blackness. I mean, it, it is just so uncalled for. So, and a lot of people go through this. And unfortunately, there's also this mixture about, you know, uh, but some people really want to change. They don't want to be gay. Listen, gay people do not have a choice for being gay. Lesbians don't have a choice for being gay, for being lesbians. Transgender people don't have a choice for being transgender. But we need to create a society and an environment that is conducive for their living. Of course. You know, I mean, and, and I think that, you know, sometimes people uh, take it to another, uh, you know, level or they're just, you know, sexual deviants. Now, human beings, all human beings are sexually created as well you know sex and sexuality is for fun and pleasure that is also why i am very active within the sexual health community you know the sector itself where we provide you know sexual health advice you know you know people have the freedom to have the sex that they want to have yeah. but as long as it is appropriate and it is legal and you know and it is what they want but, you know, sometimes people think that, you know, oh, God, you know, there's a conflict, you know, you're a priest. You shouldn't be advising people or giving them information about sex and sexuality. I say, yes, it is within my right to do so. Because I would rather that someone, you know, have a, a better understanding and good knowledge about their sexuality and the sex that they're having, you know, than they don't have those information. Yeah. It is really important. And, you know, honestly, I mean, let, let, me, let me go back to the issue around conversion therapy. Having said that, you know, House of Rainbow um, introduced a survey and I, and I hope that by the time, you know, we're sharing this broadcast, the survey might still be active, that we want black people in particular to complete this survey. Because this survey is asking some serious questions about representation. It's asking us about our experiences of conversion therapy and unless we contribute to this survey we will not have the data mm -hmm. there are other organizations that has done survey on conversion or the impact of conversion therapy, therapy but it didn't represent the black lesbian and gay bisexual transgender and queer communities so we need that data so we can say to the british government that this is how this conversion therapy has affected our lives as black people and more so, many black people who are lesbian and gay also have experience of conversion therapy from our country of origin. So, if we get a successful legislation against conversion therapy yeah. in the UK, it will also have an impact on conversion therapy outside of the UK. Definitely. Because it means that, you know, parents and families or religious leaders will not be able to ask people or send them to Nigeria or to Uganda to go and get conversion therapy. No, they will not be able to send them outside of the country. You know, House of Rainbow and myself will continue to fight for the rights of gay people in England and anywhere else that we can fight. Yeah. You know, we fight for people in Uganda, we fight for people in Nigeria, Malawi and so on. So for me, it's a great joy and, and pleasure, but it is a really difficult work. You understand me? And um, I, mean, I remember one of the meetings we were having around conversion therapy and we, we just had a meeting with uh, the Minister of Equalities and the language that was used to address the gay people, the, the, the rhetoric that was used mm. you know, to respond to our needs were less and not forthcoming. There was, there was no compassion towards our requests and I remember breaking down with emotions uh, that, you know, no, I mean, this is not sustainable. We can't carry on like this, you know. I know what I've been through. I know what many other people have been through that seriously cannot even face the world. They cannot be so open like I've been open. And for me, it is crucial that we have this conversation and we begin to address the negative impact of conversion therapy on the lives of gay people, lesbian, bisexual, trans people.
you, you spoke about sexual health. I want to well, I mean, let me you. thank you so much. I think I know where you're going with this, but let me just correct you very quickly. Um, sexual health is not something that we call battle with. Yeah. You understand me? Um, I think sexual health in particular is what people live with. You understand me? Um, and, and let me break the ice, you know, quite clearly. I mean, when it comes to HIV in particular, people are not battling with HIV. Right. You know, it, it's not a battle. We're not in a ring fighting. But, you know, people are living with HIV. HIV is also a list of terminal long-term health conditions. Now, the good news is that HIV is manageable. Now, if I don't tell people that I'm HIV positive, nobody will know. And I have been HIV positive for good 18 years and I am beautiful, I am black and I'm African and I'm queer. Mm -hmm. And I want to celebrate all of that. So there is no part of me that I want to apologize for. There's no part of me that is in a battle with the other. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Yeah. But I think I also understand and I empathize, you know, with people that had other terminal illnesses, maybe like cancer or sickle cell, you know, or, or any other one that makes people really, really more vulnerable. Yeah. That is why when we talk about the pandemic and COVID-19, a, a lot more people who are terminally ill were actually more vulnerable to uh, the impact of coronavirus yeah, right. so, so that it would take their lives. Yeah. Um, it does not mean that people with HIV were not impacted by coronavirus, but you know, people survived. People like myself, I had coronavirus, but I survived it mm. alongside with many others. Now, let me make it clear. Um, HIV is not a crime. It's no, not. is it a sin? It's a virus. And, you know, for many people that are sexually active, um, it is important that they take care of their health. I mean, my advice is that if you're sexually active and you don't know your HIV status, get tested every three months so that you know your HIV status. If your HIV status every three months, you know, is negative, then you're fine. Mm. Okay? But the other thing again is that, you know, the, the world of medicine is advanced. Is. If you're sexually active and you're not HIV positive, you can also go on what is called PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. You're wearing the T-shirt. So, and, and of course, you know, um, if, you are, if you test and you come back as HIV positive, the reality with that is that, you know, it is not a death sentence. You can still achieve all of your dreams right. and your desires, even with an HIV diagnosis. And that is why my organization, House of Rainbow, we are creating spaces for people that are newly diagnosed with HIV. I mean, you know, the last weekend just gone, we had a, a peer support, you know, for black men who have sex with men who identify as gay, bisexual and trans gender we came together we had a peer support it was an outdoor you know beautiful sunshine at the weekend and we had some good time together mm. and for me that is key that is very important that we continue to create the spaces and help to support people otherwise people are going to have these negative reactions and right. and the other thing i'll also say is this right when i first came out as gay you understand me a lot of people called me an abomination they said, um, you know, destined for eternal damnation. Oh dear. I'm going straight to hell. Mm. Now, on a serious note, about, about eight or nine years after I came out as gay, I was diagnosed with HIV. And then people said, well, we said that he was going to damnation. You know, HIV is the punishment for him being gay. Now, listen, as a Christian, as a child of God, I have to work very hard to turn all of this around. And I'm not joking, right? First of all, being gay is not an abomination not. and being gay and HIV positive is not a punishment for this so-called abomination. I am a deeply loved, a dearly beloved child of God, regardless of the circumstances. So I'm talking to you right now and I'm talking to anyone else that might be listening to this broadcast that you are deeply loved. And that is why I celebrate who I am. I celebrate myself by saying, to my servant to God that I am a happy holy homosexual I am you know G-A-Y for me means God adores you I God accepts you God anoints you and so on and so forth and I think I, we need to we need to speak those words we need to have this positive reaction especially when it comes to the condemnation of LGBT people we're not uh, we just didn't fall out of the sky of course we are a gift to this world we're a gift to our families and friends thank you very much Thank you. Reverend Jide, for coming to this show. Thank and you. I am 
100% sure that our viewers would like to have you some other time. Sure. We do hope when next we call you, Thank you. you honor our call. Absolutely, no problem at all. Thank you very much. I've been chatting with Reverend Jide Macaulay of the House of Rainbow. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for watching. Keep commenting, keep sharing, and please, and keep subscribing as well. Click on the notification button for more interesting videos like this. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.